Welcome to the Church Online Campus. We are so glad you're joining us. If at any time during the message tonight you have a question or you'd like to connect with us, go ahead and join our live chat to the right of the screen. One of our online hosts will be more than happy to talk with you. For all the questions regarding our church and what we're all about, go ahead and visit welcometothechurch.com. Now here is tonight's message. Enjoy. Well, a long time ago, I shouldn't say a long time ago, it was probably 10 years ago or something like that, there was a man who lived in Texas, and his name was Dave. Dave worked at a small food distribution company, and he was an accountant. He just ran numbers, and he had a very normal, average job. Dave didn't love his job. He didn't hate it. It was just a job to him, but Dave pushed through every day, and he worked very, very, very hard, and the reason why is because Dave had a dream. He had a massive dream huge dream. And Dave's dream was he wanted to buy his very own fishing boat. And not just like a little fishing boat you take out on a lake. He wanted like big old, just real luxurious fishing boat that he could go out, take his kids, his grandkids out on and take them all fishing. And he loved to fish. And so Dave worked very hard. He saved every extra penny he could. Uh, He worked any extra shifts he could. He'd pick up other things, little side jobs. And Dave worked for years for this fishing boat. And He worked for about 15 years and finally accumulated enough money on the side to buy his fishing boat, to achieve his dream. Well, when that day came, Dave went to the bank, got all the money out, went to the dealership and bought his brand new fishing boat, took it home and parked it in his driveway and had all of his kids and his grandkids over and they all looked at the boat and, oh, Grandpa, this is an awesome fishing boat. Dad, this boat is going to be great. I cannot wait for you to catch fish on your brand new fishing boat. And so Dave was excited. He could barely contain the just the excitement. He was so ready to get started fishing on his new fishing boat. And so all of his family left and Dave got ready for bed and decided I'm gonna get into good night's sleep because come four in the morning tomorrow I'm going fishing on my brand new fishing boat. Well four in the morning came and Dave gets up, stretches, gets his tackle box, gets his fishing pole, puts on his cool fisherman vest and hat and sets out fishing, and he steps up on the deck of his boat and feels the wind in his hair, and he can just barely contain the happiness as he cast out the line the first time on his fishing boat. Now, like most good fishermen, Dave is very patient, so he waits five minutes, no bites, 10 minutes. Well, maybe I'll cast over here. Maybe the fish just aren't biting in this area, so he pulls the line back, and he casts over here now, and he waits five minutes. 10 minutes, 30 minutes, cast another time, and hours go by. Dave's been fishing now for four hours, his first time on his, his new fishing boat, and he's still excited. It's a great boat. It's awesome, but he's not catching any fish. He's getting a little frustrated, so he decides to, you know, pack up for the day and head home, and then he'll come back out and try again tomorrow. So Dave does. He goes home, gets a good night's sleep, and The next day, he gets up early, gets his tackle box, his vest, his hat, and heads back out fishing again. And so as Dave is fishing the next day, he realizes he's having the same problem. He's he's been fishing for hours and hours now, and on his second day, he hasn't caught any fish. Well, one day goes by, two days go by, three days go by, a week, two weeks, three weeks, and Dave is a fisherman with an amazing boat and just has not caught any fish yet. Well, about a month into his uh, fishing career on his new boat, he still hasn't caught any fish, and he's getting real frustrated. Man, I I worked my whole life for this fishing boat. I put a bunch of money from savings into this fishing boat, and I haven't even caught a fish. I'm still empty-handed. I have everything I need to catch a fish. I mean, I've got so I could catch a real big fish, but I, I can't catch anything right now. I don't know what's going on. Well, one day, as Dave was frustrated after another fruitless day of fishing, one of Dave's neighbors drive by and say, hey, Dave, you ever going to take the boat out on the water? <laughs> okay, so I understand, <laughs> I understand that this was, a, it was more like a bad joke than a good story. <laughs> but I want us all to just be real honest with ourselves here, and let's look at the principal thought process behind Dave's error here. And I think if we are honest with ourselves that we'll realize that we make the same mistake that Dave made very often. Man, this mic is tight. Um, It's a simple error of perception. 
Dave was so focused on what he had in his hands and what he could do with his hands. And he had everything he needed, but he was so focused on what he had and what he needed, he wasn't focused on where he needed to go. He had everything he needed to catch a great fish. As many fish as he could have wanted. He had all the worms. He had a great fishing pole, an awesome fishing boat. But he was in the wrong place. His head wasn't focused on the right thing. And we do this a lot as human beings. I do this a lot. Now, I'll put it in terms uh, of my walk with Jesus. I'm a worship leader. This is what I do for a living. I, I love working in ministry. But a mistake that I make sometimes in a battle that I face in my life and my walk with Jesus is I focus so much on what I do with my hands and the, and the actual work I'm doing, and I, I lose sight of why I do it. And as a musician, I love music, everything about it. I love playing music, listening to music, writing music, you name it, I probably love it. But I also, I love Jesus with all my heart. And what I do, what I get to do is a dream job. I get to merge the two. I get to play music for Jesus. But sometimes I find myself up here playing, and I have to battle the thought process of, oh, man, I really hope I can sing this note right, or, man, I hope I don't mess up this guitar part. It's a little harder than normal. And I'm up here worshiping Jesus, but thinking about me. How messed up is that? We all do this in different areas of our life. And not only us, not only me and you and Dave in Texas, but mankind has been making this error for centuries, since the beginning of time. So we've got to answer one question first before we can figure out how to solve and cure ourselves of this dilemma that we're in, of constantly focusing on what we have in our hands and neglecting to acknowledge God for who he actually is in our life and uh, for being our Lord and creator and the real reason we live and breathe. How do we fix this? Well, first we've got to figure out what is the important thing? What do we need to be focused on? Now, in the Bible, in, in Matthew 6, it's uh, 31 or 32, it says, don't ask what should I eat or what should I drink or where should I sleep. That's what the Gentiles ask, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. To put that in layman's terms, basically it's saying, don't worry about where's my next paycheck going to come from. Don't be focused, focused on money. Don't be focused on the situation that you're sitting in. But seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the one who sustains you and the one who gave you life in the first place. And all those other things will fall into place. doesn't mean you're going to be wealthy, but it means you'll have peace through financial ups and downs. doesn't mean that life is going to be perfect, but it means you will be content and have contentment in life when it is good and when it is bad. Seek first God. And all these other things will fall into place. But like I said earlier, again, we as humans have, have struggled with seeking God first for a long, long time. And our problem, really, I'm going to move this stool here. Our problem initially started at the beginning of time with just a simple lack of acknowledgement of who God was. I'm going to move this so you all can see it. Let's talk about God himself, who, who God is. There's a really cool verse in 1 John 1 that I like to think about sometimes. And it says this, it says, in the beginning there was God. And the, the verse has a little more to it, but I want to focus on that little phrase right there. In 1 John 1, 1, it says, in the beginning there was God. That's a very simple statement, but if you really think about what it takes to make that possible, it's very profound and pretty intense, actually. So if in the beginning there was God, that means there was nothing else but God. This is, let's imagine this whiteboard here is the, the void, the abyss. There's nothing. No universe, no nothing yet, but there is God. So God is in the middle of it. He is all that exists. That's pretty incredible when we look at our existence as humans. God can exist with nothing else around him, which means the ability to exist lies within him, his make. He's made of life. He is, life flows from him, not to him. As humans, we are the exact opposite. God is independent. He can exist whether any of the other variables are there or not. As humans, this is me. I'm going to draw myself on the board. My stomach's a little rounder than my head, but um, we'll just flip it for my sake of confidence up here. Um, so this is me as a human man. 
And there are certain things that I need to survive. Um, and I'm just going to name four of them. There are hundreds of things that we need to survive as humans that we probably don't even know about. But here's four of the pretty obvious ones. We need oxygen. We don't got that. We're probably not going to last very long. That's why I don't have a house on Mars yet. I would love to. It would be really cool. Um, anyways, uh, we, we need water. We don't have water. We can't survive. We don't have food. We can't survive. And I know we need sunlight for warmth, and there are a plethora of reasons we need sunlight. Without just these four things, out of the hundreds of things we need as humans to survive, we will die. We will cease to exist. Our species can't continue without these things. Now, so it's safe to say here, we are completely dependent. We depend on the world around us. We depend on nature. We depend on plants and animals and trees and oxygen and the atmosphere to keep us alive. God is the exact opposite. God is independent. But if God was first, that means in the beginning there was God. At some point, he made oxygen, H2O, food. He made the sun. And so not only in our emotional life, not only in our spiritual well-being, not only in however we choose to think we need God, in every way possible. There is literally nothing. The chairs you sit on, their original existence, will date back and trickle back to God at some point because nothing existed before him. And he will go on past the existence of everything. He's immortal and eternal. And that means that everything that we are and everything we depend on comes from God. He is literally the most important thing in the universe because at one point in time, he was the only thing, and everything came from him. So, that being said, let's get into the meat here. Let's talk about mankind's start, how we, how we initially came to be. Well, in the beginning, of course, there was God, nothing else. And in Genesis, um, I don't know if you are familiar with Genesis or not. If you're not, go open the first chapter of the Bible and read Genesis. It's one of the most incredible stories ever. It's such a cool book in the Bible. But that said, in Genesis, God creates the world. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And it's a beautiful, poetic creation of everything we know and love today. God created the universe. He hung the planets in orbit. He made the trees that we see outside. He crafted the mountains with his hands, and he spoke the he spoke everything into existence and lastly god made man he made a man named adam this is adam shortly after god created the first woman named eve he's a little shorter than adam so now we have adam and eve the first humans. Now, Adam and Eve's existence was a little different than ours because it was perfect. God created Adam and Eve in his image, and he was directly connected with Adam, to Eve, Adam and Eve. Not only did Adam and Eve have oxygen, food, and everything they needed physically to survive, but they had God's really unblocked relationship with God as well. They were connected directly to him. The Bible talks about Adam walking in the garden with God and talking with him. They lived in perfect unity together. Not only that, but because of this connection with God and because of how close they were with him, and their bodies were perfect. Their bodies weren't subject to decay or disease. They lived in a utopia called the Garden of Eden, and every, every one of their needs was fulfilled again. Physical, spiritual, emotional, everything. They literally lived a completely full life. But something happened that tripped Adam and Eve and thus spiraled mankind into this dilemma that we face today of not acknowledging God. And what happened was this. Adam and Eve, not only did they have everything they need, but God gave them a job in the garden to name all the plants and animals. Not only did he give them a job, but he gave them one rule. There was a tree in the Garden of Eden that Adam and Eve were not supposed to eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam and Eve, if you eat the fruit from this one tree, you will die. 
And that was the law that they had to live by. They could not eat the fruit from that tree. Well, one day Eve was meandering around the garden doing whatever, you know, she wanted to do that day. I don't know what you would do in a utopian garden. It would uh, eat a lot of really good apples, I guess. I don't know. But Eve's walking around the garden, and she meets a serpent in the garden. And the serpent says, I guess serpents talked back then. The serpent says, did God really tell you that if you eat the fruit from that tree, you're going to die? She said, yeah, God told me and Adam that if we eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that we will surely die. And he says, that's not true. If you eat the fruit from that tree, you'll become as wise as God. You will become knowledgeable like him about everything, and you'll become like God. And Eve's pride swelled up. And at this point in mankind's history, very early on, we made a horrible decision to choose us over God. Eve saw the beautiful garden she had in her hands all around her. And she mistook that garden for her own greatness instead of God's. And her trust of God dwindled as she took a bite of the fruit that she was not supposed to eat. So Eve chose her own way. Not only that, but Eve took another piece of the fruit to Adam. And Adam was also deceived. And Adam ate the fruit that he was not supposed to eat. And this was our first decision as a species to defy God's commands, to choose our own way, to choose pride and the desire to ascend to something greater than we were over God and over trusting his law and his command. We sought something outside of our relationship with him. And this is what happened. God has to keep his promise. He cannot lie. And so when we chose ourselves over God, this connection that we had with him was cut. And there were a lot of side effects. Like I said earlier, all life comes from God. Life does not flow to him. He does not need anything. We need him. Everything that we see around us needs God. And when that connection was cut, the utopian Garden of Eden became tainted with Adam and Eve, and they had to leave. And when they left, their bodies became subject to decay and disease. They were no longer perfect. Instead of having all the things they needed around them, they had to work for food now, and they had to search for water and build shelters because the world became a dangerous place when sin entered. And I would love to say that the mistake stopped there, that they learned their lesson and they decided, you know what, from now on, as a species, we are going to completely trust and follow God's law to a T. But I can't. Because later on down the road, Adam and Eve had children. They had multiple children, but two of their children's names were Cain and Abel. Now, Cain was a farmer and he worked the land. He, he had fruit and all these different plants and he harvested vegetables. And Now, Abel was a shepherd. And Abel worked with sheep and animals. And one day the Bible says that they were making sacrifices to God. And Abel sacrificed one of his best sheep. And Cain sacrificed what he could spare from his harvest. The Bible says God accepted Abel's offering because it was his best. He, he offered literally the best he could offer. And God accepted it. But Cain was angry because God did not accept his offering. Cain merely grabbed what he could spare from his storage and gave it to God. Now, Cain was bitter about this, bitter towards his brother, bitter towards God because his offering was not accepted. And so God tells Cain, if you do what's right, will I not accept you? He tells him, dude, if simply do what I ask you to do. Give me your best and you will be accepted by me. But Cain can't do it. Like Dave standing on his boat, he's so focused on what he can do with his hands. Like Adam and Eve, they're so, he's so focused on I have to do this my way. I have to fix this my way. And Cain murders his brother, kills him in cold blood. And once again, mankind is punished. Cain is punished for his sin against God. And he's exiled to wonder as a fugitive. Because of his decision, he chose to 
grab onto exile rather than choose a relationship with God. And so again, it's like, okay, that's two major you know, faux pas that mankind has made so far. We need to get our act together and figure this out. But instead of fixing it there, mankind continues to spiral away from God, constantly choosing this over what God wants for us. They constantly choose their desires. They constantly choose their lust. They constantly choose their pride and their, how they feel about themselves rather than submitting to God. And it ultimately leads to their annihilation. Later on in history, mankind gets themselves destroyed in a flood because of our sin and our neglect to acknowledge God. And it's kind of crazy. This is literally, and it's kind of depressing to look at, actually. If you look at the Bible, we're only like 15 chapters into Genesis here. We just started. It's like I was a counselor at a camp one time, and I, all, my, all the kids walked in, and they uh, sat down in their bunks, and they were signing in and stuff. And like within five minutes, a kid punched another kid in the face. And it was like, we just started here. I got to send you home already. We just started camp. That's like humanity here. We just started to exist. We're like mere, maybe 100, 200, 300 years into existence, and we've already slapped God in the face like five times. Pride. It's crazy. It takes many forms. Now, this didn't stop there, of course, sadly. In Romans, Paul is talking to the Jews in Rome. And he's talking about this phenomenon that's been happening throughout history. And it's kind of crazy how it develops. It starts as, you know, disobedience and lack of acknowledgement. And it takes multiple different forms. But at this point, it had taken, <laughs> it's gotten kind of crazy. And Romans 1, 19 through 23, it says, For what can be known about God is plain to them. He's talking about mankind and us as, in general. Because God has shown it to them, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. But they, we, are without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of an immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds, animals, and creeping things. So mankind disobeys God. Mankind chooses our way over his. Mankind completely neglects to acknowledge God altogether. And then mankind replaces God with his own creation. That's like Clayton giving me 20 bucks. Instead of thanking him, I say, Hey, Kenny, thank you so much for that $20. It's really going to come in handy. We're sl- it's like slapping him in the face. He, he gave to us. He gave this beautiful world to us. Like we just diagrammed. We cannot live without oxygen alone. And oxygen does not exist without God. Everything we are, everything we know today comes from him. And over and over and over and over, we choose to focus on the gift rather than the giver of the gift. We thank the earth for something it did not do. We thank ourselves for something that we are not. And it it just continues to get worse and worse. Last week, this really goes hand in hand with what we talked about here last week, of the wheel, that we roll through life and we need the right thing at the center of our wheel. Sometimes we replace ourselves, we replace God in the center of our wheel with ourselves and our pride and Maybe it's our job that we're so focused on our work and making money that that's the center of our wheel. But when a bump in life comes, that job can't sustain the weight of the bump because it was never meant to. It wasn't meant to hold weight. Only God can hold weight in the center of our life. And constantly as mankind, we are, and me and you, we are constantly replacing God in the center. We're replacing God as God and replacing him with God knows what. (laughs) Whatever we are focused on at the time, whatever situation we're sitting in at the time. And man, 
I ran into this issue firsthand, and it hit me right in the face a couple weeks ago. Celebrate with family is probably one of my favorite things I, I do every year. I get to be a part of every year. And it's probably one of my favorite things I've ever been a part of. I love putting on and helping put together Celebrate with Family. Because I love music. I love playing great music. I love working with the, my team to put it together. The camaraderie and just the, it's just a fun, stinking weekend. We're all working hard and exhausted and putting together this great event. And it's such a great time. But this year was a little different in Celebrate with Family leading up to it because some things had changed. We had a new building, and so it wasn't quite plug and play as much. It was easier in some areas, but it was quite difficult in other areas as far as getting like these lights up. There's a lot of electrical work that we had to do by hand and all this, a lot of different stuff that came into play that really put me on a time crunch. And so I'm like learning on the fly, trying to put stuff together, and I really wasn't feeling like I got the time to focus on the music side of things as much as I wanted to and all this different stuff. And I was stressed and angry for some reason. And I, it was literally like a, probably a month of 100-hour weeks just going hard trying to get this place ready for Celebrate with Family. And I found myself towards the event just real stressed for no reason. I was thinking stupid thoughts like, Man, if this isn't good, if, if, if I can't get this done, then that means, that means I'm not good enough to do this. Or I'm thinking thoughts like, man, if Celebrate with Family isn't as good as it was last year, then, man, we failed. And just thinking really prideful, stupid, arrogant thoughts of trying to validate myself to me, basically. Tell myself that you are, you are good enough to do this. And if you're not, you, this doesn't come out well, then something's wrong. And I was getting stressed and angry and tense and tense and tense. And uh, it was on Thursday, I think, before Celebrate with Family. Everything was about ready to go, and I was actually sitting on that stool right here. And I was working on one of my songs that we were doing for Celebrate with Family, and I just couldn't get it. For some reason, the lyrics, it was a very wordy song, and I couldn't get the lyrics right. And I was getting real stressed out. So I took a break, and me and Cheyenne went and got lunch. And I remember being in the car and talking to Cheyenne about some different stuff, and I was stressed and just in a bad mood. And she finally looks at me and says, Jordan, you should not be this stressed about Celebrate Family. I don't know what's wrong with you. You should not be this stressed. And I hit the steering wheel as hard as I could, and I said, dang it, Cheyenne, yeah, I should. And I, everything got real quiet in the car after that. And I like, felt this knot in my heart. And it, it basically was just saying, Jordan, why are you really stressed out? What's the real reason you're tense about Celebrate with Family? Is it because you want to put on a good event for Jesus? I don't think so. Is it because you want to represent God well? You want the church to represent God? No. It was pride. It was petty. I was trying to validate myself to me. I was trying to prove to myself, Jordan, you are a good leader. Jordan, you are a good singer. Jordan, you are a good... And it's petty crap that doesn't really matter in the long run. And that's why I was upset. So after lunch, I got back to the church and I started practicing that song again, again, to no avail. For some reason, I just could not figure out the lyrics on this song. And I was sitting there and I finally just stopped. And it was one of those moments where I'm not an emotional person, but it was like one of those laugh or cry moments. Now, I sure as heck wasn't gonna laugh so <laughs> I was sitting there like, Lord, I need your help. I can't, the event's going to be fine. I don't know if I'm structurally going to be fine. I don't know if I was just exhausted or what the deal was, but I wasn't me. And I sure as heck wasn't focusing on God. And so I remember sitting there and I just paused for a minute. And I grabbed my acoustic guitar and I just decided to take a break from all the craziness. And I wrote this little prayer to God. I, I, I like to write prayers out in song form. It's one of my ways I like to worship. But I just quieted everything else and focused. And I sang this song. It goes, Jesus, lead my heart back to you. 
when I've gone astray, when my songs are nothing more than pride and my affection for you fade. Lead me to your pasture, only there am I fulfilled. Let me want only your presence, let me seek only your will. Jesus, lead my trust back to you when my fear is taking hold. When the waves have got me frightened and the world is growing cold. Oh, your rod and staff, they comfort me as you prepare a table for me. In the presence of my enemies, I'll be still and know you, Lord. Oh, there is nothing like your peace as you're walking next to me. You are all that can sustain me. You are all I'll ever need. Oh, forgive me when I fail to recognize you, Lord. Oh, I love you, but help me, Lord, to love you even more. And I sat there just quiet and ashamed of my attitude for the last month. And I just prayed, God, help me focus on you. It's so hard to do because I'm weak. I can't do this on my own. I can't sustain life on my own. I can't complete this massive titan of a job standing before me on my own. Because I was never meant to do it on my own. And I was so focused on my own strength and who I was as a leader, who I was as a person, that I forgot why I do what I do, why I live life, why I'm even alive in the first place. So what I want to do today is this. If any of you are honest with yourselves today and you've been in that same situation as me, and again, it takes multiple forms. In Adam and Eve, it was an attempt to better themselves, and they, they forgot who created them in the first place. And Cain, it was, he was so focused on something he didn't have that he forgot to trust in God and, and how God wanted him to live. For mankind during the flood, it was sin. Mankind was holding on to their ways and neglecting to acknowledge God. And sin took God's place. For me, it was just simply pride and arrogance. <laughs> I'll tell you this, after putting my trust back in God, Celebrate Family this year was probably the most fulfilling event I've ever been a part of. Because I let go of myself, and I just trusted God to do what only he can do through the event, whether I felt like I was ready or not. I saw a group of people on the production team work harder than they've ever worked. And with a joy that was contagious to me, at least, doing it. And together as a team, we worshiped Jesus. Screw whatever we thought it should have looked like in the first place. We just put our hands up, and we worship Jesus together as a community of people putting on Celebrate with Family. And it was one of the most fulfilling things I've ever been a part of because it had nothing to do with this. It had nothing to do with my pride. We were just doing what we were created to do, and that is acknowledge our God. So if you're here today and you're like me, we need a little focus adjustment, or maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus. And your focus is solely on this because it's all you have. Well, just know that God loves you. He wants nothing more to than to reestablish this with you. Thanks again for joining us at The Church Online. If you'd like to give towards the church, go ahead and press the Give button at the top of the screen. For all other questions, comments, or prayer requests, email us at info at Have a great week.